Good morning. Welcome to our Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, February the 4th, 2020. I'd like to call this meeting to order and ask if there's any declarations of interest at this time. Seeing none, we will move to community announcements and perhaps I could start with Councillor Crothers and I'm just gonna go right around here. Thank you. Thank you. Happy February, everyone. Um, members of our community are uh, celebrating <clears throat> this weekend, uh, members of, of the Jewish faith are, are celebrating Tuba Shavat, which is also known as Arbor Day. It's a new year of trees uh, for, for that community, and that celebration starts on Sunday. And also Gung Hei Fat Choi to our Chinese community who is celebrating the new year. Thank you. Councillor Crothers, or sorry, Councillor Crone. Uh, with thanks, uh, Madam Mayor, I have nothing to report. Go ahead, Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's been a, a busy uh, month of, of preparations for most of the committees that I'm liaison with. Um, and uh, when we get closer to some of the events that they're planning, I'll uh, have some announcements for them there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Persicini. Good morning, all. Um, for the promote our event on uh, the big colossal and pancake breakfast should be on Sunday, April the 5th. Uh, starts at 9 o'clock to 11. These, our committee, we share in Queensville, are working very hard on this. And seems a lot of, seems to be a lot of excitement through our committees. And, and uh, we're all working together. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'll, I'll be the first one to have a big, big, big pancake. Thank you. Did you say you're going to make the pancakes or eat the pancakes? We'll probably do both. <laughs> <laughs> Since you. I'm trying to stay in shape. <laughs> Councillor Morton. I have nothing to report at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a couple of uh, quick things I wanted to mention. Uh, our Trails Advisory Committee, um, with the help of uh, the excellent staff that we have working with us, are uh, sinking their teeth, for lack of a better term, into the uh, uh, the trails master plan uh, and uh, they're looking forward to uh, completing that and, and working their way through I'd also like to mention the heritage advisory committee are very very busy working on a work plan for the next probably 12 to 18 months um, just to kind of set some goals and objectives uh, of things that they'd like to see get done the other thing I wanted to mention was the East Willenberry coldest night of the year in support of Blue Door Shelters. That's on February the 22nd. And we do have an East Willenberry team, so we're looking for members and uh, support uh, for that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, every February, Canadians are invited to participate in Black History Month festivities and events that honor the legacy of Black Canadians past and present. The 2020 theme for Black History Month is Canadians of African descent going forward, guided by the past. This was inspired by the theme of the United Nations International Decade for the People of African Descent, and that's 2015 to 2024. Also, I wanted to mention uh, we all are aware of the coronavirus that is um, Certainly a, a part of everyone's discussion uh, recently. As everyone knows, this is now a world health emergency. Ontario Health continues to monitor and work with the medical industry to monitor, monitor this virus and the chance of contacting the virus here in Ontario remains low. Uh, I would suggest if anybody is looking for any information, the Ontario Health uh, website and York Region Public Health site uh, both are uh, updated daily. With that, um, I, we will move to uh, our character attribute. Um, Councillor Persicini, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, character community is when I work with the initiative, I will take the first step to make uh, something positive happen. Be original and innovative. Feel empowered to act. Do something on my own without prompting by others. Lead by examples and teach whatever is possible. Keep up to date about the fields in which you work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, item D is presentations. And Mr. Clerk, uh, would you introduce our presentation? Mr. Webster, you're going to introduce it. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, here we are in our second month of uh, 2020 and up and running, but uh, it's often uh, often good to uh, reflect on uh, where we've been as well. And uh, our uh, corporate communications group has worked with our uh, our leadership team and put together a, uh, a terrific presentation for this morning that talks about 2019 uh, in review. And and one of the things is. Um, it was the first year, full year of this term of council. And uh, one of the things that was very notable was the uh, accomplishments was the strategic plan itself, which is in the top right corner. And, uh, you know, we're very proud. Uh, it was facilitated using our own resources, uh, staff team, and designed using our own staff team as well. And uh, Danielle Vernoy, who is going to make the presentation today, was integral in designing and, and part of the strategic plan. And she is going to walk us through the uh, accomplishments of uh, 2019 as they are aligned to the strategic plan. Laura Hanna is actually going to introduce her, who is our Director of Communications, and uh, to the, together they will do the presentation. So, good morning, Madam Mayor, members of Council, public and staff. Uh, my name is Laura Hanna. I'm the Director of Communications and Customer Service with the Town of East Guilmbury. Danielle Vernay and I will be coordinating this presentation. Today we're pleased to be here to present to you the second presentation as part of the 2019 to 2022 strategic plan. Our first presentation came in August of last year, which was the mid-year for 2019. Once again, we'd like to thank all of the staff who really helped to prepare this content because it really is a town-wide process to get us here. Twenty nineteen was a groundbreaking year in East Guilmbury with our Operations Center, Queensville, and Mount Albert Community Center parks. Our Operations Center is now well underway. Our annex location is open. We cheered on the Raptors to be the NBA champions, and we even launched our council live streaming. To start with, we wanted to walk you through a few of the 2019 key capital projects and major expenditures from the year. Of course, two of our largest projects would be our Operations Center and our Health and Active Living Plaza. We're gonna to touch on both of these, present, or these facilities a little bit later in the presentation, so just high level. Uh, the Operations Center is tracking on schedule and on budget for occupancy in early 2021. We know that our staff are really looking forward to this new facility, and we're also really looking forward to beginning the public consultation, which will talk about what will happen to the land next to the sports complex once the works yard moves over to the new Operations Center. For our Health and Active Living Plaza, that's again one of our major projects that we're moving forward towards. We always like to remind everybody that this will be East Goldenberry's first aquatics facility, but of course it's going to be so much more than that. It will have space for a new library, community partners, gymnasium, and one of our largest outdoor parks once complete. Right now, this project will be funded entirely through development charges. Currently, staff have applied for a grant application and we're keeping our fingers crossed and hopeful to hear something in early Q2 2020. A few of our key capital projects related to parks were our Queensville Park and our Mount Albert Community Center Park redevelopments. Both of these are well underway and are excited to be opening in 2020. The Queensville Park includes an expansion from two tennis courts to three tennis courts, um, enhanced shade structure and walking paths throughout the facility. Staff report that they're about 40% complete right now, so that one is looking at about a summer 2020 opening. The Man Albert Community Center Park redevelopment, again, is well underway. Uh, it will have the new skate and scooter zone, which is sponsored by the Man Albert Lions. It will also have a new picnic structure, new parking space, and just this winter, we've opened our outdoor skating rink. Due to some unfortunate weather, warm weather and rain, it's closed at the moment, but we're really hopeful that with some coming colder temperatures, staff are continuing to build that base up and we'll have it open again as soon as possible. Our Anchor Park lighting, uh, that was completed in the summer. It was really to help us expand playable hours at both the soccer fields and the baseball diamond and enhance security. Uh, with this upgrade, we're able to have about 1,200 extra billable hours of space on those two diamonds. A couple of our key frontline services um, that were key capital expenditures in 2019 was the purchase and retention of our new aerial fire truck which came in August. It's now, staff are trained on it and it's fully operational. We also have our large wheeled loader, which has been purchased and delivered. Staff are doing a few final tweaks to get it operational and we're expecting that to happen in Q1 of 2020. 
We also have our annual asphalt resurfacing program. In 2019, that included 7.4 lane kilometers of road rehabilitation, and it also included about 1,200 meters of concrete rehabilitation and installation. And that will move forward into 2020 again with our next program. As Tom mentioned, one of the biggest accomplishments for last year was the planning and adoption of our 2019 to 2022 strategic plan. This is really what sets the stage for the next few years and how we're going to be reporting back to you and making decisions about projects. We'll be using these priorities, the four seen on the side, to walk you through the remainder of the presentation. To start with, we want to look at the responsible growth and environmental protection priority. This priority is really about ensuring that as we grow, we protect our residents, we protect our heritage and our environment. We want to grow responsibly. We also want to ensure that we attract a variety of growth, which we're going to be addressing more in depth during next week's February 11th Special Council Growth Management Workshop. Under each of the priorities, you'll see a number of projects, and we could go on all day about each of those. However, we're just going to highlight a few of the major ones of interest for today's presentation. Under responsible growth and environmental protection, there's been a great deal of work looking at our plans for the future. So things such as our transportation and water wastewater master plans, which are moving forward, and a review of our development processes. These are the types of work that we need to put in place now to prepare for future growth. The new City View software is a project that is a really great example of modernization and how a new software is going to help us deliver enhanced services in a more modern fashion moving forward. There's also been a focus on protecting our environment and staff are actively working on a climate change review which will be coming to Council in 2020. One of the major focuses of 2019 has been the expansion and development of the town's economic development function. In September of 2019, we hired our economic development manager, who's supported by two secondment assistant positions. This team has been involved in a number of initiatives throughout the year already. So things such as the external partnership to create an auto campus agreement and assisting and liaising with the different town departments to ensure success, successful occupancy and opening of both the Longo's location and the Vince's market locations. We will also be showcasing some of our non-residential dashboard during the next council workshop on February 11th, and that's something that staff have been actively working towards throughout 2019. The next priority we'll be talking about is quality programs and services. This priority is one that's seen in many strategic municipal plans. It's really the priority that focuses on ensuring we create a community where residents can experience that quality of place. Uh, East Goldenbury is not just a bedroom community, but we want to make sure it's one where residents feel welcome, they can interact with each other, and it's really what makes East Goldenbury feel home, uh, feel like home. It means that we support our residents from a baseline services, making sure that they have a safe community, but we also focus on creating opportunities for healthy and active living and focusing on arts and culture. So a few of the projects under this area that I wanted to touch on really talk about how we've been moving forward the organization throughout 2019. One great example is the waste collection program. This is a pilot program, which is really a service level enhancement for our residents. So previously, if a resident had more than two bags to put out on garbage day, they would have to take those items to a waste depot. The minimum cost to dispose of those items would have been $10. Now they can purchase bag tags through our customer service, and for $2, they can set out an additional bag or even a bulky item. So it's a really great service level enhancement for our residents. Another way that we're moving forward and modernizing is the updating of our bylaws. Firstly was our parking bylaw. Um, in order to update that, we really undertook significant public consultation and surveying. The importance there is that we wanted to make sure that as we updated that bylaw, it really reflected what residents wanted and their concerns and their needs. We also updated our fence and cost sharing bylaw. This was, as we have a number of newly built homes, this will be continue to be a significant topic of interest for our residents. We wanted to make sure that our bylaws were up to date, they reflect current practices, and we're ready for those residents that would have those questions. Another area of modernization was the preparation of our online payments and self-service tools, which I know many of our residents are looking forward to. Those were approved in 2019 as part of the modernization project and you'll be seeing different modules being rolled out moving forward, and those would include things such as the ability for residents to access their accounts online for water and tax bills. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, ensuring that we provide that baseline safe community is one of the most important things that our town provides. Our emergency services team has been extremely busy in 2019. They continue to have their year over year 10% increase in inspection and prevention education programs, and they also increase their specialized training. This area has always been one of our leaders for municipal partnerships and working with those partners to ensure that we're effectively delivering services. And they continue those partnerships with things such as the integrated response team, which continues to train with our partners, the York Region Paramedics and YRP. Before I pass it over to Danielle, I just wanted to talk about the East Glenberry Public Library. Although they have their own strategic plan, it's really an important part of our community and our town where we create spaces and places for residents to come together and enjoy the community. They continue to expand their programming through a variety of demographics. For example, the new 100 Books Before Kindergarten is a reading incentive program that encourages children to read 100 books before they even start school. They also continue to build their digital literacy programs. In 2019, they expanded from Hotspots, Chromebooks, and GrowPros to include DVD players, webcams, and tablets. And those are all free with a library card. I'll now pass it over to Danielle to take us through the remainder of the priorities. Thank you, Laura. I'm going to continue the presentation with our next priority, which is build commu complete communities. This priority represents building infrastructure that will connect our growing community as well as providing opportunity for residents to stay engaged and active. One project I know a lot of us are excited about is the construction of the town's new operations center. A lot of progress was made to the facility structure and currently walls are going up. The design of the facility incorporates many innovative features including the natural treatment of water before it leaves the property, a tree farm, a water filling station and vehicle charging stations, just to name a few. The Health and Active Living Plaza is another exciting project that will be coming to EG. In 2019, staff hosted 30 public consultation opportunities, awarded a contract to MJMA Architects and toured other rec recreational facilities in the GTA to gather ideas for the help. What's next? Staff will be hosting stakeholder meetings and are hoping to have design concepts ready by the end of summer. Creating awesome spaces to play has been a big trend for EG over the last two years. And last summer, we opened five new parks, updated park playground equipment at two locations, and began construction of two major park redevelopment projects in Mount Albert and Queensville. The park opening celebrations were a great opportunity for residents to check out the new parks, meet their neighbors, and connect with our customer service staff directly. As you can see on the screen, communications has been expanded to include signs directly at the park, inviting people to join us for the party. Creating new areas to play is important, but it's also important to ensure that our infrastructure is up to date and that roads are maintained. Key highlights last year include the approval of our asset management policy, working with our partners like Metrolinx, and a new streetscapes program. Those physical projects are key, but we've also established a broadband working group to explore opportunities for improvements to connectivity in EG. Our final priority is a culture of municipal excellence, which ensures we are continued to build on, great, on the great work that we're doing in the areas of communications, customer service, while, rem while remaining engaged and nimble. Some of the new ways we've engaged our staff team is through new training opportunities, an updated performance management process, and the launch of our new learning management system, the LMS. As you can see by the numbers on the screen, the LMS is off to a great start with a total of 515 courses completed so far. We've also approved our inclusion charter, which outlines our town's commitment to making EG welcoming and inclusive for everyone. 2019 launched many great programs, initiatives, and projects that will help us plan for our town's future. The Peak Performance Program was launched to find efficiencies in some of our current processes, creating a more streamlined approach. Our rec team has also had a busy year with the Ferry G launch and the Engaged EG program. Both programs have had great participation in their first year, as you can see by the numbers below. The Ferry G brand is expanding for 2020 to include a senior subsidy program, which will be open for registration in the coming months. A new town logo for EG was another large project that our communication staff worked on in 2019. We took the feedback from our residents, staff, and council, and we'll have some exciting options coming next month. So please be sure to stay tuned. 
Fiscal responsibility is another important part of planning for our future. In 2019, this town received grant funding to support town projects like the revitalization of Center Street and public education programming. As we grow, we will continue to look for additional funding opportunities where possible. Two internal processes that we're extremely proud of are the development of our strategic plan and the development charges bylaw, which was, which was approved without any appeals. In 2020, the town will be undertaking a DC and a CBC background study and pass two new bylaws as a result of Bill 108. 2019 was a great year for EG, and we're very excited to see what 2020 has. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Questions from our staff? Wow. It's been quite a year. I, I thought we were moving pretty fast, but, but to have it put together uh, at a presentation like this really talks about uh, 12 months that were very, very busy and very productive. Um, no, normally, a new council, it takes a little while to get up to speed, and, and if this is the speed of the first year, look out for the second and third. I think it's going to be a very exciting times. We uh, are doing very well. Questions from members of Councillor Crone. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you to our presenter. Uh, I, I really do appreciate the comments, the, the one line you made on slide 14, uh, where you acknowledge uh, broadband as a core infrastructure and the need to enhance it. So thank you for, uh, for saying that for those of us that don't have great broadband, that, uh, that lets us know that it's very much on our, our radar screens. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, clarify, the, you mentioned uh, the logo We'd be, uh, we'd be coming to a decision on that next month, is that? Uh... Uh, well, we're gonna be bringing a report to council okay. in March um, with options okay. for moving forward. All right, I know uh, there's some folks in, the, in town that are very eager for it. Yes. And, uh, and it's, uh, of course, it's, it's tied to uh, our new signage that we'd like to get out. So uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll all be uh, happy when this is resolved and, uh, and we can move on with it. So thank you very much. Uh, as, and I echo the uh, the comments of the mayor. It, it is incredible to think of how much we've accomplished in the first twelve months. So uh, nice job, thank you, Councillor Crothers. Thank you, and thank you for this presentation. Putting it all together like that, it really does seem like we've accomplished a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I too am excited about the new logo, and I think that we need to continue to communicate that it doesn't replace our crest, but it's uh, it's new and it uh, has its, its own purpose. Um, I have a question about um, the signage that we use, the mobile signs that uh, appeared in the park slide. Um, we don't own those; we rent those. Is that correct? The Quebec signs? Yes, the, we do yes, rent it. We rent them. Um, it seems like we use them a lot. Would it be worthwhile to, for us to be looking at buying signs like that? Because um, you know, I know the, the groups I sit on are looking at using them, and uh, it is expensive to use them. I'm just wondering if uh, it's something that we've thought of buying because I think it's a great communication strategy. They're really effective. Uh, yes, it is an effective tool. Um, we have looked at options for purchasing si similar signage, but Curbex does own the li licensing for that. Um, like road sign, mm -hmm. so we just, it would be better if we just continue with Curbex because we can't unfortunately mock up something that they own the licensing for. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing, seeing none, uh, could I have a motion to? Councillor Persicini, all those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you very much, well done ladies. We are at item E, and that is deputations. And Mr. Clerk, could you introduce our first deputant, please? Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, our first deputant is Adam Layton, a partner with Evans Planning Inc., making a deputation and committee regarding items F1 and F2 on your agenda. Welcome. Good to have you with us this morning. Oh, okay. Um, as indicated, I'm here to make a uh, presentation for the proposed development, uh, the Sharon Corners property, uh, just a little bit north of us here on Mount Albert and Leslie, uh, specifically with regards to applications 19T17004, draft plan of subdivision, and site plan approval, uh, control approval 1904, which would be the proposed retirement home. Um, for brevity, I've condensed both applications into one presentation. Um, so as you uh, may be aware, the pro subject property is located at the intersection of Leslie Street and Mount Albert Road, 
It comprises 19180 Leslie Street, 1420 to 1484 Mount Albert Road, and blocks 107 to 111 and 113 on registered plan 65M4512. Uh, it's the property outlined generally in red. There are two holdout properties being the property at 19168 Leslie Street, as well as the Hydra Transformer. Um, but we have done our best to incorporate uh, those factors into our proposed design. Um, as you may recall, there is a bit of a history on this site that's been through a number of official plan amendments in 2018 and 2019, as well as a zoning bylaw amendment in 2019 as well. Um, the proposed comprehensive plan is shown here on uh, the slide. I believe uh, hard copies have also been distributed to council. Generally, what we're showing is a seven story retirement home along Mount Albert Road. Uh, which would be the first phase of development. Future phases include the potential for a seven-story apartment building, a number of town condominium townhouse uh, dwellings, and a mixed-use building on Leslie Street. Accesses would be restricted to one in from Mount Albert Road, which I will get into more detail shortly, and one in from Leslie Street. These accesses have been coordinated uh, with town and regional staff. And we have also been in contact with the owner of the lands to the south to try and coordinate uh, all the access points, minimize uh, potential for conflict with pedestrians along those public roads, and to ensure that everything is designed and implemented accordingly so there's a, minimum, uh, a minimal amount of construction activity. Uh, moving along, uh, we have the proposed plan of subdivision, which is comprised of seven blocks, two of which are for road widening purposes, block eight. Uh, shown here is a tra the trapezoidal shape, which would be conveyed to the region for the access on Mount Albert Road. A similar trapezoid would be conveyed from the, to the, from the lands to the south to facilitate an intersection. And as well, Block 7, which includes a trapezoid and some additional road widening uh, to facilitate the future access from Leslie Street. Generally, these blocks are, have been created merely to provide an underlying plan of subdivision to facilitate the future development of the lands. Future applications will be required, including site plan control and uh, one or more uh, plans of condominium. Uh, it is noted that the retirement home block has been severed out of the draft plan of subdivision, which is a slight change from the, when we were here for a public meeting, um, and that was approved this past summer. Um, moving a, li a little more closely to the site plan application, um, the, the retirement home property is outlined in red, consists of a seven-story retirement home with 204 units, this includes uh, memory care, assisted living, and independent living suites. There's a variety of uh, outdoor amenity spaces provided. There's patios um, at the north end of the property, at the west end of the property, and uh, some seating areas along the Mount Albert Road frontage. Um, these have all been reviewed and uh, coordinated through the site plan application with staff, and further details have been provided through that application. But uh, suffice to say, a wide variety of amenity areas have been provided both indoor and outdoor for future residents. One important aspect is that will be implemented through the site plan and draft plan of subdivision, which I forgot to mention earlier, is the implementation of a mixed-use pathway uh, along the full frontage of Mount Albert Road from the Leslie Street intersection all the way connecting to Countryman Drive and the regional trail facility. That's a three-meter wide mixed-use pathway, um, which will... In, uh, increase connectivity. Another factor that is to be implemented um, is the urbanization of Mount Albert Road on the north side. In order to facilitate the proposed access to Mount Albert Road, uh, we are providing um, turning lanes. We are provide, uh, roughing in the uh, conduits and all, all the necessary infrastructure to facilitate the future signalization of this access on Mount Albert Road. The proposed development um, first phase, the retirement home itself is not enough to trigger the warrant from the region. However, we are making uh, um, provision to ensure that uh, once that warrant is triggered, everything is in so that there is no, re we don't need to tear up the road again. Um, another aspect that's being incorporated uh, is some further upgrades to the Leslie Street and Mount Albert Road intersection to make the in crosswalks AODA compliant. So that would include um, the installation of, of the tactile plates, um, realignment of some of the, uh, the lighting and uh, push buttons, and uh, fresh painting of the crossings themselves. Um, and that is to be implemented through the uh, proposed, at the time of the construction of the retirement home. Um, another, another factor that's going to be um, 
that is uh, included in the draft plan of subdivision as a condition of approval is the submission of a plan to further detail and outline the trail connection from the interior of the site to the regional trail. So, that, so we will thus have two connections to the regional trail from the interior of the site and from the MUP. Uh, moving on a little further, um, I think what everyone's waiting for is what will this look like? So we have here some conceptual renderings uh, of the proposed retirement home. Um, this is Mount Albert Road looking east. Uh, we do have the MUP along the frontage as well as the proposed landscaping and the architecture of the, the building. Um, aside from the at-grade amenity areas, we do have balconies for all the independent living suites. Those would overlook the street, thus giving us that eyes on the street that uh, is uh, so desired. Uh, an alternative view looking the opposite direction, looking west, just gives you, again, you have the mixed-use trail uh, in front of the property, uh, conceptual uh, design for what could happen on the south side of Mount Albert Road once that development proceeds and just some, some more details of the architecture of the building. And then further details of the north side of the building with a secondary access and some a seating area and some of the parking area. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the, uh, the, develop, the, develop, oh, sorry, the operator of the retirement home is Rivera. They are well experienced with uh, numerous uh, facilities across uh, Ontario and Canada. Um, some examples being uh, the Williamsburg and Burlington, the Renoir and Newmarket, and Westney Gardens and Ajax. So we have an experienced operator bringing on um, a well-designed and, well and much needed facility, which will provide jobs for what I'm advised is approximately 130, uh, 130 full and part-time jobs in uh, help to facilitate the urbanization and uh, improvements to the public realm in Sharon community. Subject to any questions, I'm happy. Thank you very much. Very exciting questions from members of committee. Councillor Persicini. Just comments. It's just, this is a very exci exciting time for us. Looking forward to see the finishing part of it. So far, looks great. So congratulations. I love it. Thank you. Questions. Councillor Crone and then Councillor Crothers. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you to our presenter. Uh, thank you very much for. Uh, for sharing this with us today. I think this um, this will help fill in uh, another piece of the jigsaw that uh, we need in in, uh, in East Gwillimbury for uh, what I call life stage uh, living. So we it'd be nice to be able to be born, born here and, and live your entire life here. Right now, not everyone has that opportunity. So this goes a long way to helping that. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on a, a, a stat you shared with us. You said there would be 130 New jobs created, uh, or estimated new jobs. Esti no, yeah. are they full time, part time, or I think it's a, a combination of both. Okay, yeah. do you know which way it leans a little? I don't. Okay, no. all right, thanks. Yeah. Anyway, we're getting jobs. That's yes. always good, and they're spending money in these Willenberg. Thank exactly. you, Councillor Crothers. Thank you. This is exciting, and uh, as I've said, when you presented here before, I think this is exactly what we need. I echo Councillor Crone's comments. Um, I have a couple of questions. The 130 jobs. Um, full time and part time. Uh, that sounds like a lot of parking. I know it won't. They won't all be there at the same time um, because there would probably be a lot of twenty four hour care needed. Um, but I'm thinking we, there's got to be a lot of staff on site at any one given time. And is there enough parking for that? Um, well, th uh, through you to the councillor. Um, through the zoning bylaw amendment process, we did uh, undertake a number of parking studies. Um, which did implement uh, a requirement for 90 parking spaces, which we are actually exceeding with 96. Um, that being said, Rivera being the large operator that they are, they do have quite a number of retirement homes to draw on and gain data from. Mm -hmm. um, some preliminary uh, assessments of their other facilities have been provided to us, which indicate that uh, the rate that is actually utilized rather than provided might actually be lower than what we are providing. So where we're you know, we've provided a requirement for 90. Um, information provided on another retirement home indicates that uh, as few as maybe 84 spaces are required. Okay. And that's based on surveys taken at peak times of all utilization of the parking facility. Okay, that's, uh, that's comforting to know because I'm thinking about families visiting yes. on Mother's Day or whatever and, and yeah. being peak usage. Um, I, I had some questions about the um, town's green development standards in the report. Um, 
that uh, we have. It talks about uh, uh, meeting the, the green standards and exceeding them. I was wondering if you can uh, talk about the uh, level one, level two targets, um, and even there's a level three target as well, which um, of those you have um, incorporated into this building. Just to clarify, we're talking about just the retirement home, not the draft plan? Right. right. So these okay. are... Yes. Or, yeah. um, so uh, as you know, we've, we have been working on this uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone through several iterations of the green development standards. Um, in order to achieve a, you know, approval of the development standards, you have to meet so many tier one, tier two, tier three standards. Um, and so some of the, you know, the tier ones are, we have to do them, they're mandatory. Tier two and three, that's where we get a little more voluntary and a little more creative. So some of the measures that we've implemented are, um, you know, whereas uh, so I think, I believe it's a tier two standard requires that a certain proportion of the roof needs to be a cool roof or other. Um, we are going to be providing 100% cool roof. Um, some other measures are, we're going far and above for bicycle parking, as well as integrating um, storage rooms uh, and shower and change facilities for staff to help alleviate that parking requirement as well. If you live in the community and you work at the facility, you could bike there, shower, change, be on your way. Um, and then I guess, as would, one would expect in a retirement home, uh, the, all of the independent living suites are going to be barrier free and uh, have you know, accessible access to all their daily needs, bathrooms, uh, kitchens, amenities, all, all that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, and as I've said before, uh, with regards to Block 7, which is <clears throat> proposed as townhouses between Building A and, and the retirement residents, um, that, I know we're just talking about the retirement residents, but it's all part of the same package. Mm -hmm. um, so I've stated before, I think that that area really needs to be green space um, because of the retirement home. I think that having green space next to the retirement home is uh, something that would be beneficial to our aging residents. So I know it's part and parcel of the whole concept, um, but uh, I just wanted to put that back out there yet again. Thanks. Councillor Persicini. I forgot to ask something very common. Uh, would you have a little mini gym for people to do some exercise in there down the road? So I can teach it, you know? <laughs> I'd have to consult the plans. I do believe there is a great deal of amenity area. Yeah, there is a multi-purpose room provided at the, on the ground floor. Essentially, the whole ground floor is your typical amenity building support services. So there's a Health wide well. area of space <laughs> that's available for various programming functions. Thank you. Councillor Morton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This may be a question to staff rather than to the developers. and. Uh, that is, at what point will um, diagrams be given to the Accessibility Advisory Committee to, uh, to go through and, and give their comments on what they see and maybe what they don't see? Go ahead. Dear Madam Mayor, uh, the site plan for the retirement center has already uh, gone to the Accessibility Advisory Committee in the past on at least one or two occasions, but I, I will follow up and uh, um, there's obviously another opportunity to have a discussion with them, but at least on two occasions we have uh, vetted the site plan to the uh, committee for their review and comments. Okay, because I, I know that, I mean, we have new members on that committee and uh, some of them may have some different ideas so okay thank you Councillor Roy DiClemente uh, thank you madam mayor um, through you to our presenter I, I, I I'm sure I'll have a few more questions when we actually start to deal with the staff report but uh, obviously there are some uh, some significant investments being made here on the site and and in regional infrastructure with the multi-use trail and the in, and the infrastructure at uh, Leslie and Mount Albert Road uh, I've raised it before, and I don't think it's going to come as anybody's uh, a surprise to anyone about a, a north-south connection. Uh, we've got a subdivision, which uh, your clients are uh, responsible for having built, uh, to just to the north here on Countryman and Festival Court. Uh, we're adding additional residents to this area who are going to be wanting to access that regional trail infrastructure. 
but we don't have a safe way for them to cross the street. Uh, and uh, I, I don't, I know that the rough in for signalization is being put in at the entrance driveway, but I'm, I don't see a connection north-south being made. I'm just wondering if any thought has been given to it at this point. Um, we are uh, working on the details of, you know, the design of the full stretch of Mount Albert Road with the region. Um, again, we are implementing the in improvements at Mount Albert Leslie to help facilitate the north-south connection there. Uh, it's anticipated at in the future when the signal is warranted, there will be crossings at the access to the site on Mount Albert Road. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, you know, it, as we are, as Mount Albert Road is a regional road, we do have to work with staff on where and what, uh, where crossings can be implemented appropriately and meeting their standards. Um, but as we are still in the detailed design stage for this road, we can definitely convey uh, the, the thoughts. I, I would suggest in the long term, the connections are there. Uh, potentially an interim solution may need to be explored. Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just one thing that I noticed, um, I'm going to echo Councillor Carruthers' sentiments about the parking. I'm still not sure that 96 spots is uh, is adequate for that. Um, but the chart right below on page 31, I, I just wanted to question. It shows 34 units on the second floor, which is assisted living, and 34 units on the third floor, which is memory care. And then all the independent living floors above that are also 34 units. I would expect that the independent living units might be a little bit bigger than the units for assisted living and memory care. Uh, is there a square footage uh, that you have that you can uh, let I'd us know what those independent living ones would be? It just looks to me like something doesn't add up there. I'd have to uh, refer to the plans. I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, it might just be something you can get to us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I would. I would. I would hazard a guess. Actually, the memory care may be um, might actually be a little larger the units than the independent living, just because they might need more medical equipment or or facilities. Um, but we'll definitely get that information for you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, I'm really happy to to see the uh, MUP being part of this project i think that's really important and as we grow we need to make sure that uh, other projects pick that up as well it's the only way that we're going to be walkable and, and uh, we are certainly making many plans for sharon to be a walkable community so i'm really i'm really pleased with that um i don't think i have any other questions at this time um with that i would uh, ask for a motion to receive, Councillor Morton, all those in favor, that's carried. And I would uh, ask for a motion to bring F1 and F2 forward at this, this time. Do I have a motion for that? Thank you, Councillor Crothers, all those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you. So we have uh, brought F1 and F2 forward at this time, and um, I'm just going to take carriage of that. Councillor Crothers, please. First, Councillor Crone, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we have uh, F1 is the uh, in the Development Services, the Joint Development Services Planning Branch, and. Community Infrastructure and Environmental Services Report E2020-07, Cycling Application by Wycliffe, Thornbridge Sharon Corners Limited. Mr. Ramuno, would you like to um, bring us up to speed on this, please? Certainly. Thank you, uh, through you Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, I think Mr. Uh, Layton provided a, a pretty thorough presentation on the, uh, the two items. Um, I'll just add that, again, the first, uh, first report is for Council's consideration of the site plan approval for the actual retirement center building. The uh, second report um, deals with the uh, plan of subdivision. Um, and as Mr. Layton uh, mentioned, um, it is for the purposes of creating a, a number of blocks uh so that they can be registered for uh, to facilitate future site plan applications we don't have um, uh, 
definitive plans yet at this point for council, but at a future date, council will consider the uh, subsequent site planning condominium application approvals for the uh, future phases. So the uh, site plan application before council is really uh, is the first phase of development that will occur on site being the retirement center. And I'll just add with respect to uh, some of the questions that were raised by council with respect to access, the multi-use plan and the uh, trying to facilitate or advance the uh, intersection improvements um, <clears throat> to the south. Um, the region has signed off on the access improvements as a condition, they have required that this developer include all the infrastructure for the future signalized lighting. Um, they don't believe that it warrants signalization at, at this point. However, the build for the retirement center will likely take you know, uh, well over a year, close to two years. We'll continue to work with the, uh, the region. But once the site plan application on the south side of Mount Albert comes, I'm sure that will be the trigger for uh, that intersection to be signalized. Uh, what's key is that the, uh, this developer is including all the underground wiring and infrastructure for that to happen uh, at a later date for the region to essentially just uh, install the, uh, the lights, et cetera. If there are any uh, additional questions, I'll be uh, pleased to uh, answer them, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's, uh, let's get a mover first on this. So we're looking for uh, approval to execute the, uh, the site plan approval, uh, execute Earthworks agreement, and give uh, Mayor and Clerk uh, approval to execute the, uh, the agreement. And I have a mover for this, moved by Councillor Morton. Okay, now, any questions? Councillor Wright, you Clemente. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, I believe this is a, um, a CIES question. Uh, with respect to the Earthworks Agreement, um, just looking for reassurance that any fill that's being imported will be uh, from uh, an approved uh, source site, and we can be assured that it's been tested before it arrives. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, certainly the uh the earthworks that, uh, that would be coming in, all the fill that would be imported would be under the direction of a QP uh, and would be tested to meet uh, on at a source site and also on the, uh, on the filling site. Uh, and all the material would have to meet table two as per the uh, MECP requirements and regulations. Thank you. Are there any other questions? One more? Well, I thought there would be more questions. <laughs> Uh, for me, uh, I acknowledge and realize that signalization isn't warranted at this time, but uh, I think I've been very, uh, again, clear that uh, I think that we, it, we need to explore some kind of way to get pedestrians uh, north-south, and whether it's at the driveway, whether it's at Countrymen, whether it's uh, at the trail connection, it, it doesn't really matter to me other than the fact that we've got residents that are there now that are uh, taking their lives into their hands trying to connect. Uh, and we're going to be adding more residents when this building comes online that uh, that might move a little slower than than others. And uh, I think it's important that we provide whether it's an interim solution or whether it's a permanent solution. I think it would be uh, it would be uh, safe and appropriate for us to find some way to do that. And I'd I'd like to suggest that uh, that staff be directed to work with the proponent, York Region, and other stakeholders provide for a safe north-south pedestrian connection at an appropriate location across Mount Albert Side Road to connect local trail systems. And I don't know whether that's a, a resolution that needs to be added here. I'm happy to make a separate resolution. I, I don't want to necessarily tie it to uh, the approval because I think that we do want to move this forward. This ticks a lot of boxes for us and, it, and it's an exciting community amenity. I just want it to be the very best it can be. And I think this is uh, something that if we don't do, we would be, uh, it would be an oversight. Uh, staff, uh, do you wish to have that uh, put into a resolution or shall we just list it as noted and that it will be acted upon? Um, through, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I believe uh, a separate uh, resolution would probably be helpful on uh, that one, but not tied directly to the uh, seniors' uh, site plan. All right, very good. Um, we'll make that second resolution after we deal with this one. Uh, Madam Mayor? 
Just a comment to that. This is a regional road, and this won't be anything new to the region throughout uh, their nine municipalities. So I'm, uh, I really would hope that the region would step up with a solution and work with our staff, um, whether it's interim or, or long term, uh, may, may be one of, of each. Um, I guess my greatest concern is the region at this point are saying that it's, uh, it doesn't warrant lights at, at this time. So until the building is, um, is full and uh, staff is full, we may need to push the region uh, somewhat to make sure that, that both areas there, both the lights that uh, are, are being proposed and the, uh, the possibility of putting a crosswalk or uh, something uh, further down for our trail system is, is uh, dealt with appropriately. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other questions? All right, can we have a vote on this uh, as moved by Councillor Morton? All in favor? None opposed, motion is carried. Uh, now, Councillor Roy DiClemente, you had a proposed a, a resolution. I see you typing furiously. What do you have for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will send this to the clerk. Uh, that staff be directed to work with the proponent, York Region, and other stakeholders to provide for a safe north-south pedestrian connection at an appropriate location across Mount Albert Side Road to connect local trail systems. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, moves? So moved by uh, Councillor Roy DeClemente. Do we have any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, you'll have that sent to you. So we're moving on to F2. F2 is the Joint Development Services Planning Branch and Community Infrastructure and Environmental Services Report. The 2020-05 Wycliffe, Thorn Ridge, Cern Corners, Limited, west of Leslie Street, North Mount Albert Road. Mr. Ramona, would you like to add more? Do we need to add any more? Uh, please share with us. Uh, no, Mr. Chair, again, this is the subdivision, so we're seeking council's uh, approval of the draft plan of subdivision just to create those future uh, development blocks. Uh, there are a number of conditions. Uh, we've also included the uh, similar condition with respect to uh, authorizing staff to execute the earthworks agreement which uh, uh, will allow the uh, construction of the access point onto uh, Mount Albert to proceed and to service the uh, uh, retirement building. Thank you. Can I have a mover for this please? Councillor Persicini. Are there any questions? Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Uh, in the in the past, we've had conversations, and I'm not sure at what point in the planning process uh, this would happen, but uh, where we've uh, applied some breaks uh, when servicing allocation isn't uh, isn't imminent or available. And I'm and I understand that this application, uh, this portion of the application, doesn't have servicing available. And so, uh, is it premature for us to be subdividing? To you, Mr. Uh, Chair. No, it's not premature at this point. Uh, if I can refer counsel to, I think it's Appendix 3, uh, when the property, um, the entire land holding was, uh, property was uh, zoned last year. Uh, the R6-162 uh, zone was put in place subject to an H1, which was uh, to confirm uh, servicing allocation prior to any site plan approval. So, no, that uh, provision condition's been uh, put in place through the zoning. Uh, so um, the future site plan applications for the future apartment building and townhome can only proceed to council at, a, at such time when there is additional servicing capacity to service those blocks. So the H is in place uh, over the balance of the subdivision lands. Okay. Are there uh, any other questions, follow up? Seeing none, I'll uh, call for a vote on this. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. I'll uh, hand it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, other deputants as well. Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, we have uh, two deputations uh, submitted. Uh, one was um, uh, P. Barbero making a deputation in committee regarding item G1, which is the uh, Joint Legal and Council Support Services and Development Services Planning Branch Memo, Status Update Local Planning Appeal, uh, 
Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, appealed by the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. Uh, Ms. Mavero, Ms. Mavero, Mavero has submitted her deputation in accordance with the procedural bylaw time deadlines. We do have an, an additional submission that was received yesterday uh, from Mr. Russ Robson on the same items, and that will be up to Council for uh, allowance of the deputation. I'll deal with the uh, um, council uh, discussion regarding a late um, request for a deputation. It's your pleasure, members of committee. Councillor Foster, you're okay. If we could have uh, a motion to that effect. All those, all those in favor, and that's carried. Okay. So our first one. Mr. Clerk, go ahead, please. So your first deputant is Ms. Barbero. Good morning. As you can see, we have a very full day today, so we're going to be very tight with five minutes. Uh, and I'll give you the high sign as you're, as you're approaching the five minutes to conclude. May I clarify with the clerk? Um, uh, I, we had also filed because Mr. John Gamble uh, is currently in the hospital. He's just actually undergone a quadruple bypass. He has survived it. Um, he is, so he is live <laughs> to, uh, to continue the, with the request. Um, he, he was uh, put as, uh, he had filed his deputation um, and simply the summary got sent in a bit behind because of uh, the nature of his health condition. He'd had uh, multiple coronary infarctions um, and uh, thus couldn't do it sooner. So I was simply going to be speaking, uh, reading his submission on his behalf. Uh, do I have permission to do that? Because that was not mentioned by the clerk. My understanding is that you have submitted? Uh, he was submitted separately. So, uh, on his own sheet, unless it was misunderstood. This is why I want, we wish to clarify okay, before I begin, you. if I may. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Mr. Clerk. For clarification, Madam Mayor, there was a, uh, a deputation from Mr. Gamble um, identifying Ms. Rivero as the agent, and Ms. Rivero's deputation was representing other individuals as well. So I thought council may want to just hear from Ms. Rivero on, on, on the matters. So the intent is that your uh, deputation will include uh, portions of his as no, well? No, it was not. It, they were separate deputations. His, his uh, I think, I believe it was also made clear in the email that was sent that his opinions would be those of his in the EGLA. Mr. Webster. And that's what's on his uh, request. The email I saw from, I, from uh, Mr. Gamble clearly indicated he's, uh, he was ill and uh, and that he would ask uh, Ms. Rivero to read his submission. I think that would be helpful as, as well to have it as part of the public record. I'd just like to note um, in this case, uh, this LPAT hearing, 90% um, of municipalities would have dealt with this behind closed uh, doors. We've been fully transparent all the way along from Madam Mayor and Council, even to the point that we held a community open house uh, meeting at the sports complex and I think in the interest of full transparency we should allow uh, Ms. Rivero's and Mr. Gamble's uh, submission to be uh, read in as well. Okay, thank you. So with that you you have five minutes uh, and I will give you a high sign and um, as I said, we we are very for both, tight today. For both. Um, is for that both? Yes. Okay. Just for, thank you for clarity, okay. Madam Mayor. All right. Um, so I will go ahead with mine first. Thank Please. you, Madam Mayor and Council. Good morning to you all. The, um, We're looking forward to new information since you've been in front of us several times. Yes. Thank so you. the Town Council. Uh, said that they would listen to our voices and to the citizens and act accordingly. We clearly voiced at the September 11th, 2019 public open house that no changes to the bylaw would be acceptable to us. And we asked that it be kept intact as is and for the LSRCA to withdraw their appeal. Town staff that night promised that they would not put us through an expensive hearing. On October 1st, 2019, council moved to formally request that the LSRCA withdraw their LPAT appeal of the town's comprehensive zoning bylaw. The town stated that we are in conformity and that no changes are necessary to the ZZBL. No correspondence either to or from the LSRCA in response to this motion has been entered into the minutes or public on public record, nor any motion to the contrary made since that open public meeting. Rather, November 12, 2019, 
as council has the right to do, they held a special council meeting and it was moved to enter into a closed meeting to discuss the matter. None of the party status members were notified of this meeting or aware of it. We only found out about this the other day when we filed our motion for deputation. We were led to believe that the CBZL 1997 as amended May 15, 2018 was in complete conformity with the town's official plan and to be left unchanged. We asked that any correspondence be publicly posted and entered into the minutes of the council uh, with the resolution. Um, we would ask that the town reconsider their position and not to move to enter this letter. We are not in agreement with this correspondence. The region's official plan is currently under review and the town staff were directed on December 3rd, 2019 to undertake the town's official plan review. The LSRCA, the basis of their filing with the LPAT, is that we're not in conformity with the regional and town's official plans. If this is the case, what better opportunity than now to address these matters directly? It is unnecessary to change the bylaw if we are in conformity. It is our opinion that these proposed changes in no way, shape, or form alter or affect conformity with the Greenbelt, PPS, York Regional Plan, or the Town of East Gwillimbury Official Plan. We request, again, that Council and staff uphold their promise to the citizens of East Gwillimbury of this town not to make any changes and officially again ask the LSRCA to withdraw. The 2018 council approved CBZL already contains an interpretation section that informs readers of obligations to comply with the land use requirements of any other bylaw of the town or any other land use regulations of the town of York, the province of Ontario or the government of Ontario. The LSRCA is considered an agency of the province. No amendments need to be made to the section as part of ensuring conformity to the town's official plan. We do not agree to amend the bylaw and find it an infringement on private property rights. The LSRCA at this time does not have a clear mandate and is being reviewed by the province. By changing the wording in this bylaw, naming the LSRCA specifically sets the town of East Gwillimbury up for an onerous process should the town of East Gwillimbury choose to use a provider other than the LSRCA for environmental services in the future. It is my understanding that the ratepayers of East Gwillimbury pay a fee to the LSRCA for their services. Naming them in the bylaw would seem to me to represent a conflict of interest. Hence, the current, more neutral wording should remain. Again, we would hope that you would represent our voices as the citizens of East Gwillimbury and respect our wishes. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, as per Mr. Gamble's, uh, sorry, I can't see now, <laughs> reading only, um, request, I just want to make note that Mr. Gamble, because of his health, we did not wish to upset him or shock or surprise him as he's had multiple coronary infractions um, at the time that he dictated this and had not been operated on yet. Um, so he was unaware of, uh, just keep in mind that he's unaware of the November 12th uh, um, meeting when I read this. Uh, so, and as I said, these are his, uh, his thoughts and those of the EGLA. He says, I wish to address council with the following. Any change to the CBZL, Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, which influences external regulation of any sort, maps, etc., other than by the bylaw as it stands and already established is unacceptable to the EGLA and myself. Acceptance of such regulations creates an end run on any governing body who wishes to make, add new regulations at any time with no recourse. The LSRCA has never provided a legal explanation nor sound reason why these pro particular properties in question should have environmental protection zoning applied. It is our opinion as the EGLA that they do not have authority to do so. It is haphazard and void of ground truth. The LSRCA recommended to the town of East Gwillimbury that the first 60 meters of the during this process, they wish to have zoned with an EP designation. Be left The rest left with their designated zoning as per the 1997 Z. CZBL, and that the remainder of the properties be designated with EP zoning. There is absolutely no justification of any kind for applying an environmental planning to the remainder of these properties. This is purely arbitrary and not based on any natural features, ground truth, nor scientific basis. The LSRCA provided no justification for this recommendation. Their only rationale was that they thought that it would satisfy landowners if they had left this to some without EP zoning. This had no concern for either where current structures or buildings lie, nor environmental features or any scientific rationale for EP zoning would be merited on this said land. They were apparently oblivious that as rural properties, some have structures hundreds of meters from the road and have no environmental concern or value, and thus was a completely arbitrary approach. It is not acceptable and demonstrates all the more that their filing had no ground truth or scientific basis whatsoever. Rather, it would appear quite simply a desire to covet as much land as possible so as 
consumers to devalue and control it. Clearly and obviously, the reason behind their demands is to gain control of privately owned properties and thereby gain the ability to apply conservation rules and regulations at whim without justification nor public consultation. In turn, serving to devalue these properties, it would appear EP zoning was recommended additionally to benefit stakeholders in the future development land within the town of East Quillenbury. East Quillenbury zoning over EP zoning rather over such large amounts of land would greatly lessen costs when it comes to the purchasing of private land for any parties needing and or wanting to do so from governing bodies, land developers, hydro, etc., needing rights of ways, parkland, development land, land for highway, etc., to grow further the planned growth in our town. As a further note, we do not support the York Region Forested designation on private properties and their mapping, again, is void of ground truth and scientific evidence. The town promised to uphold private property rights on May 15, 2018, and to uphold the 1997 bylaw as it pertains to private property rights and existing protection zones. It is unnecessary to change the bylaw if we're in conformity. Um, the party status members were not involved in the town's uh, any further meetings prior to the uh, receiving the LPAT notice of uh, Sorry. Could you wrap up, please? Sorry? Could you wrap up, please? I my throat gets dry, and I filed before that. I can't speak sometimes because of that. My apologies. Um, yeah, prior to the uh, receiving the LPAT notice. Um, CEO Tom Webster publicly stated that they would deliver the 1997 bylaw intact. He said at the September 11th open house at the Sharon Arena, we can't deal with conjecture, but we like to deal with his facts. We were asked to deliver a zoning bylaw that kept 1997 property zoning. Could you wrap up, please? I am. How many seconds would you like? This is all on About our website. 15. We are going to work with the authority and that they thought they had a solution and that they plan to keep this. And that's what he would expect for you to keep your word. Thank you, Ms. Madam Mayor Thank and you. Council. Thank you very much. Motion to receive. Councillor Crone, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Your next step intent is uh, Mr. Russ Robson. Good morning, Madam Mayor, uh, staff. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, same rules apply. Yeah, Hoping we're hearing something sure. different and new. Uh, um, and uh, uh, and uh, if you could hold it to the five minutes, we'd appreciate it. Sure, not Thank a problem. You. Um, I believe uh, Ms. Paula here said uh, some pretty good points there that I was going to repeat on. So I'd just like to say that uh, as a party status member uh, representing over 40 landowners, um, in the LPAT case hearing. Uh, we do not agree with the amendments to the bylaw. Um, we, we, do, we haven't seen any uh, hard facts or evidence to suggest that we are out of conformity with the official plan uh, from the decision made on May 15th, uh, 2018. Um, once again, uh, from, from where we left at the September 11th meeting, uh, we left there uh, under the uh, idea that uh, council was going to uh, officially request the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority to uh, drop the appeal. I believe a, uh, a notification was sent over to the LSRCA, but I don't know if anything was sent back um, uh, saying they received it or, or uh, if, if anything was, it wasn't sent to us to, to have a look at. Uh, once again, uh, just uh, from the report, the DS and uh, LCSS joint report, 2019-44, uh, 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 I'm just going to repeat what, uh, what I read here from my knowledge. Uh, it is the opinion of external expert planning and legal advice and senior uh, town staff at the May 2018 council approved zoning does conform with the town's official plan. Three new land use maps will be included to provide full and transparent information to residents in East Gloomberry who wish to understand uh, what regulations exist on their properties. The maps are as follows, the Green Belt and Oak Ridge's Moraine Conservation Plan areas, uh, provincially significant wetlands, regional woodlands. 
proposed uh, changes to the interpretation section of the, by, of the zoning bylaw no longer need to be considered. Uh, the 2018 council approved uh, zoning bylaw already contains an inter uh, interpretation section that informs readers of obligations to comply with the land use requirements of any other bylaw of the town or any other land use regulations of the region of York, uh, province of Ontario, the government of Canada. The LSRCA is considered an agency of the province. No amendments need to be made of this section as part of ensuring uh, conformity to the town's official plan. So that pretty much says that we're in conformity. We've paid the money to have that looked at, uh, reviewed. Um, there's no need to uh, change the bylaw. Um, I was I attended the uh, the stakeholders meeting um, on Friday, January 31st. Uh, I was invited as a guest of Romero Township. Um, they're having issues with the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority right now, and I know they've sent some uh, some letters to council. I'm not too sure if you've received it or not. Um, but uh, the table that I sat at, uh, there was a lot of concerns with uh, not mandated, not core mandated. Their outlines for the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority isn't really um, uh, specified. And uh, there was some landowners there that were having complaints about um, encroaching on their private property rights. And the, uh, the mayor of Romero Township, uh, Basil Clark, seemed to share that uh, as well. So... Um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Another, uh, another thing I wanted to bring to your attention was as well, um, I, I did have a good conversation with uh, Dean Horner the other day, and I, I thank him. He's always uh, good to talk to on the phone and, and helps out. Uh, one of the concerns was that if we amend the bylaw, is it uh, um, subject to appeal once again? Uh, so do we open ourselves up to another appeal process? Uh, from what I've read in the uh, Municipal Act, it does. Uh, so if anybody could uh, find me something that says it does not, I, I believe section 272 to 273. So um, just a concern. Uh, so once again, uh, I think if we're going to open uh, private property up to regulations, we want to have solid data. We want to have, you know, a good reason to do so. And we don't want to, uh, to give up private property rights as we have. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, that's all. Thank Thank you very much. Um, I could I have a motion to receive, please? Councillor Morton, all those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, at this time, I might suggest that we move to item G1 uh, with Councillor Foster in the chair. And um, I'm sorry, I guess, Mr. Clerk, I should have asked if there were any more deputants at this time. No, Madam Mayor. I assume that. Thank you. Um, and so if we can move to item G1 uh, with Councillor Foster in the chair. Pardon me. I, I'll come back to that. I'm doing this because we have people in the audience and in relationship to, to this one. And then we'll backtrack and get back, get back on, get back on. Uh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so with that, we'll have uh, Councillor Foster in the chair with G1. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a memorandum, a joint memorandum for uh, legal and council support services, uh, development services of the planning branch uh, regarding the status update on the LPAT hearing. Uh, Mr. Horner, do you have any comments? Sure. Um, uh, just briefly, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the purpose of this memo was simply to um, advise council and to advise the public that uh, there is a scheduled settlement hearing for this matter uh, occurring on March 23 and March 24. Uh, so again, you know, in, in the interests of, um, you know, full transparency, um, the, um, the, the town and the LSRCA will attend to um, uh, present the proposed amendments to the bylaw and the uh, parties and participants will be uh, uh, free to attend and, uh, and uh, lead evidence and uh, give their concern, uh, express their concerns. Um, I, I've already offered to um, meet with Mr. Robson to talk about, um, you know, the, 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 the technicalities related to, uh, um, you know, how that um, hearing will proceed and uh, the, uh, the binding nature of its effects. So, so uh, Mr. Robson and I will meet offline on that matter. Mr. Webster. I'd like to clarify a few uh, things, if I could, uh, for the mayor and chair on, on this one and um, Mr. Horner used the word amendments which to me makes it sounds like changes and uh, 
I don't see it that way uh, as CAO of, of the uh, town. Um, what I see is we had in 1997 an EP zone established for uh, property, yeah, all property. And uh, at one point, it was looking like it was going to get changed a lot, a lot bigger. And our council at the time uh, said, no, we want the 1997 EP zoning cap. And that was what we were directed to do. And then that is what we've delivered. There's no amendment to our 1997 EP zoning maps. What there is, is there's an acknowledgement that there's a bunch of other parties that have rules and regulations regarding private property. And if they come into our counters and ask for a building permit, we are not doing anybody justice by uh, pretending these other rules don't exist. We're mandated. Our, our, our inspectors downstairs that issue building permits are mandated to comply to provincial law, uh, LSRCA regulation, York Region regulation. There, there's layers of other regulation that we are responsible under our auspices of controlling what gets built under building permits. And all this process is done is acknowledge that there's a bunch of other regulations. And, and I see some folks here today. Um, I'd like to answer a few of the questions. Um, we do not direct, directly levy to fund the LSRCA town. York Region funds the uh, LSRCA's operations, and that's, uh, they're probably one of the biggest funders as far as uh, some of the other municipalities that are part of the LSRCA. There was questions asked, I've seen in writing, did we actually request that the LSRCA withdraw their appeal? Yes, we did. We sent council resolutions, our solicitor talked with their solicitor, our senior staff talked with their senior staff. It was the LSRCA that thought it was best to do this in a fully transparent manner and proceed with a, uh, a short LPAT hearing. I think there's a two days set aside for it. But um, part of the complicating factor is uh, there's other parties that have status and those parties and, and or participants, whatever, have, should have an ability to, to speak to the LPAT to, to render their opinion. Um, I, I think I've said before, when the Greenbelt legislation came in, um, it was very difficult for residents to go to Queens Park and, uh, and, and make a point about what could or couldn't happen. But with regards to uh, the mandate of the conservation authorities and their rules and regulations, I do know that the conservation authority has monthly meetings um, that are open to the public and uh, folks could certainly uh, seek deputy status or try to make uh, points about what they think the mandate should be or could be uh, through that process as well. So I just wanted to clarify that um, the, the use of the word amendments is in my opinion, uh, a little bit debatable on whether or not this bylaw has in fact been amended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Uh, before we move to questions, can I have a mover for this memorandum? Councillor Persichini. Any questions from committee? Councillor Morton. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Um, I have had uh, um, questions from two or three people in my ward wanting to know that um, whether this meeting on the March the 23rd will be open to the public. Can any anyone go and uh, just listen? Uh, through you, Madam Mary, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, of course, it's a, it's a public meeting. Uh, anyone is free to attend. Thank you. Any further questions from committee? Councillor Crone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd just like to thank Mr. Webster for his comments. and providing a little clarity around um, this issue. Uh, for me, and I would direct this question, Mr. Chair, to this. I just want to make clear for the record, uh, because I've heard things said out in the community that I, I, I'm not sure are factually accurate. So I just wanted to clarify this. It's my, my assumption that we have, in writing and verbally, on a number of occasions, asked for the LSRCA to withdraw from this. Now, I know we're not compelled to make them withdraw, but we have asked in writing and verbally, I know I certainly have asked verbally to um, members of the LSRCA. Can you just confirm for me that that is in fact the case? 
uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we have. Um, I, I, I've asked repeatedly of the um, LSRCA's council, and as well, uh, we've um, uh, sent formal written communication in the form of council's resolution. Any further questions? Can I call for a vote to receive this? All in favor? And that would be carried. Uh, anything else, Mr. Horner? Uh, nothing at this time, Mr. Chair. And with that, I can turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to find my way. We've, we've wandered a little here. <coughs> F F three, correct. And I'll turn the chair back to council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Forgive my earlier uh, enthusiasm. Uh, we have <laughs> item three, uh, the last one uh, for development services. It's the development services planning branch memo, additional memo, additional information memo regarding P two zero one nine dash six two CWC. Uh, that was from December 17, 2019. And Mr. Ramuno, would you uh, like to share anything else with us? Certainly through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Again, this, uh, this memo is really uh, additional information just to provide some clarity to, uh, to Council. A number of questions uh, uh, were asked when uh, the original report back in December was presented to Council uh, with uh, your recommendations to proceed with preparation of an updated and revised site plan control bylaw. And I think this, uh, we just wanted to address some of those questions with respect to um, providing more clarity to council regarding the types of app future applications that uh, would require full site plan approval and uh, the other category, which we're recommending uh, to be uh, titled as basic, where, where those applications uh, would be delegated to, uh, to staff uh, for approval and execution of uh, development agreements. And it, it really, uh, uh, it comes down to really the scale of the applications. We provided a couple examples. So council just recently uh, previously dealt with the uh, retirement center. That's obviously a, uh, a large scale application. Those type of applications would always come to council with a full report seeking council's consideration uh, for the approval. Um, you know, a future application that we're excited about and we're hoping to bring this uh, this application to council soon, uh, hopefully over the next month, is uh, the uh, Kelson Commercial Industrial Office Development at Woodbine and, and Davis. That's an example of a, uh, a full uh, scale site plan approval that would come to council. Uh, there are examples uh, of a what we would consider a basic site plan application. The one we've identified is uh, Appendix Two across the street was the old Rema the Remax building. Uh, those are those type of applications where uh, we're, we're not really seeing any development. The existing building isn't changing, but they do need to come forward to provide that reconfigure and add that uh, provide a parking space in behind. So there is, you know, limited development happening along the uh, streetscape. The building isn't changing. So that, that would be a candidate for a, uh, a, a basic application that could be delegated to staff. And the purpose of the delegated to staff type of applications would really be just to try and streamline the process to allow some of these uh, business and, uh, and employment opportunities to move forward uh, a little quick, uh, quicker through the, uh, the approvals process. Uh, again, if there are any questions, uh, I'll do my best to answer. Thank you, Mr. Ramuno. Could I have a, a motion to receive this? Moved by uh, Councillor Foster. Are there any questions? Mr. Foster? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Ramuno, I just wanted to uh, thank you and, and your staff. This is exactly the type of report that I was looking for when I brought up the questions uh, at a previous meeting. Uh, this certainly answers some questions. I think it lays it out uh, fairly basic. Uh, and uh, in the future, if I have any questions, I'll certainly come and see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Morton. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Ramuno. Um, is there going to be a difference in the costs of the applications for these uh, individuals that uh, will be applying or being put into different areas? 
through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, it's a good question. And we do need to follow up with a, uh, a revision to our uh, planning application fee bylaw as well. Currently, we do have a, uh, a number of different fees for what we identify as uh, simple and complex under the old bylaw for the Oak Ridges Moraine. So we do have uh, you know, a simple fee of $1,000, a complex under the Moraine is $2,200 and what we consider a large scale $4,400 a basic site plan fee. But uh, hopefully over the next month or so, I do, and I did commit to council previously, but we wanted to come forward with this updated site plan control bylaw. We will be coming forward with a report for council's consideration to deal with uh, uh, revisions to our planning application fees. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, can I have a vote to all in favor? All right, none opposed, motion is carried. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ramuno, is there anything else you'd like to share with the uh, committee? Uh, no, nothing further. Uh, committee, any other questions uh, for Mr. Ramuno? Okay, I uh, turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move into legal and council support services with Councilor Foster. I know that we had the uh, one um, uh, item on the agenda, but uh, there might be some other questions under your chairmanship, so we'll move it back to you. Nothing more from me, uh, Mr. Horner? Um, and nothing from me. Happy to take any questions, though. Uh, there appears to be no questions from committee, so we'll hand it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, we're under uh, item H, and that's Community Infrastructure and Environmental Services with Councillor Crumman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have uh, one item on the agenda today. Uh, it's regarding the um, phosphorus offset credit transfer agreement, and I'll turn that over to General Manager Molinari to take us through that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, further to the presentation from the region at our last uh, CWC, uh, this, uh, this phosphorus offset uh, transfer agreement basically provides, um, it would be between the town and the region, and is really uh, a, an agreement that allows uh, for the, uh, the region to proceed with the Water Reclamation Center and the additional phosphorus that would be generated by that facility. They're looking for other means in order to, uh, to offset the extra phosphorus uh, that would be uh, resulting in uh, Lake Simcoe. So the region has embarked on, uh, on a number of different pond uh, improvements uh, in order to reduce that phosphorus amount, and the Princess Auto Pond is one of those. So this, uh, this particular pond is expected to offset approximately 50 kilograms per year. Uh, and uh, the town would have to undertake a number of, uh, of measures to, uh, to maintain the pond so that it continues to deliver that, those, uh, that reduced phosphorus amount. And, uh, and the region will be doing similar agreements with other municipalities in order to achieve the full extent of the phosphorus offsets required to support the uh, Water Reclamation Center. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two motions before us on page 77 of the agenda. The first is to receive the report, and the second is to authorize the GM of CIES to execute the agreement. Can I have someone move that? Councillor Crone. Are there any questions from members of committee? Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, report notes that there's a $7,600 annual maintenance expense uh, to sort of sustain once the uh, monitoring period is over. Uh, how much are we spending now on this uh, on this pond or on this program? Uh, and uh, and I'm just wondering what happens to that $7,600? Does that increase over year over year? What happens there? But I'm just wondering what we're spending now. Mr. Molinari? Uh, three, Madam Chair. Currently, the town isn't spending uh, very much. It's spending negligible money on this, on this particular pond. And that's essentially because it's only a, uh, a, a quantity pond and that it only is uh, there to uh, take uh, to provide some storage capacity during significant rain events. It's not doing very much in way of, of quantity. And the new uh, pond that the region's looking uh, to design right now uh, also has quality built into it and with the phosphorus offsetting. So on an annual basis, um, there's, uh, there's a grass cutting that would have to be completed. And there's also removal of certain types of, uh, of, of invasive plant species and maintenance of the plants of the plantings within the pond itself so it continues to do its its uh, intended job of reducing phosphorus overall thank you just further uh, madam chair it uh, 
Well, I'm happy to have the region spend $4.1 million on installing a new stormwater management pond. I'm just, I'm a little concerned that it's, it's less than 10% of the phosphorus that they need to offset, and yet they're spending $4 million to do so. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, I'm not, it's more of a larger question of how expensive is this, is this initiative, this phosphorus offsetting going to get for the taxpayers, whether they're East Gwilinberry or York Region, that's uh, going to be a significant undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions for CIES from members of the committee? Seeing none, Mr. Molinari, do you have anything to add? Nothing further at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn that back to you, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under item I, Emergency and Community Safety Services. Council Roy de Clemente in the chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. We have one item on our, on our agenda. It's a verbal update uh, from uh, Chief McKenzie. Uh, would you care to take the microphone, sir? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mayor and Council, for allowing uh, the short verbal update with regard to officer development and leadership. Uh, senior ECSS staff recognize and acknowledge that ongoing training and development of our current and future officers is vital to the overall operation. One of the challenges that we face as a department grows with the pace of development is to ensure that our supervisors and leaders understand that their role is so much more than responding to an emergency incident. Training and professional development funding in the 2020 operating budget process was increased to initiate an ongoing process for the education of our officers and our acting officers. Our first goal is to ensure competency in the standard typical areas such as of supervision, such as health and safety obligations, policy review, and rules and regulations. We also intend to expand their abilities and confidence by providing enhanced training and report writing, managing the training session, and performance management of staff. By working with our fire partners, we are taking advantage of technological improvements in dispatch and response capabilities. Upgraded iPads in the front run apparatus will shortly be outfitted with a tablet command, an application connected to the CAD system within the Richmond Hill Dispatch Center and will immediately provide officers with address, call details, map navigation, and pre-plan information. In addition, in Q4, officers will be transitioning away from an antiquated incident command system and moving into a modern version called Blue Card Command. These changes will increase efficiencies and confidence of our staff to better manage resources at emergency and non-emergency incidents and better align EG fire services with neighboring fire departments. Also on the agenda are plans to utilize other partners such as the Region of York, OPP and Children's Aid Society and the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs to expand our officers' skills and abilities and awareness while on duty. The Deputy and I along with the HR Division will also be bringing education and awareness to all ECSS staff on PTSD and mental health awareness. We intend to launch the Working Mind First Responder Program to assist staff in understanding good and bad mental health enable, and enable officers to recognize and act when a member may be affected. These are just some of the topics that we have implemented over the next several months or years. The Deputy Assistant Deputy and I wanted to ensure that our officers are grounded in the reasons why they serve the residents of EG and have them understand that their efforts are really part of a bigger picture and team. To this end, at our company officer meeting last week, we called in an internal partner, Director of Communication and Customer Service, Laura Hanna, to provide some initial training to our staff. Laura graciously spent an evening tutoring our officers on the 2019-2022 strategic plan and covered the four strategic priorities as a base or starting point. I trust that this short verbal report was able to provide Mayor and Council with some insight to our plans and objectives for going forward with officer development and leadership. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Members of committee, any questions? Sounds like you were thorough. <laughs> Just like the training. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, when, uh, when you mentioned this to me, Chief, uh, ahead of time, uh, it certainly uh, flagged for me that uh, this, was the, this had the potential to become a municipal best practice and, and that the development of uh, curriculum uh, for uh, our leadership potentials uh, within this service uh, is, a, is an investment well made and uh, has the potential for, for being rolled out to other municipalities and other services. So I uh, thank you for taking that initiative. But may I have a motion to receive the verbal update, please? Moved by Councillor Crone. All those in favour? And that motion is carried. Uh, anything further to bring forward at this time? Not at this time, Your Honor. Members okay. of committee, anything to raise? 
Seeing none, I'll turn the chair back to you. Thank you very much. We're at item J, Community Parks, Recreation, and Culture with Council Persicini in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have one item. Uh, the Community Park Recreation Culture Facility Branch Operational Center update from page 83 you have in front of you till 93. Um, General Manager, comments on, do you have any, uh, any comments on this? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a quarterly project update. Uh, pleased to report continued process or progress with the Operations Center project. The project continues to track within schedule and approved budget. Our next steps uh, over the winter months are to complete the building envelope, including masonry, uh, steel roof deck, exterior doors, and glazing, and uh, to allow work to continue over the winter months. Our next update will be provided in early spring with a possible site tour for mayor and council. Uh, we have hosted two site tours for staff uh, that have been extremely well attended and staff is very excited uh, to see the progress with their new home facility. Uh, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our lead project manager, uh, Chris Catania, for ongoing commitment to the project, uh, in particular close monitoring of project schedule and uh, project budget. Be happy to answer any questions uh, at this time. Before any questions, can I have a mover, please? Councilor Crohn. Move by Councilor Crohn. Any questions from members of the committees? Councilor Crohn, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, I think the most important part of this report is right at the very top, and it says project continues to track on schedule and within budget. So well done. Let's keep it that way. I'd like to see that. Any other comments uh, from the members of the committee? If there's any comment, can I call a vote? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Just before I move it on to the, uh, to the next one, which there isn't a next one, but I want to make comments that uh, I drove by. What a difference <laughs> from the last time we went there and uh, did the photo op there. It's really moved quite quickly, and uh, congratulations to, all, to everyone involved. Very well job done. Do you have any comments at all, uh, General Manager? Thompson? Uh Three, Mr. Chair, uh, no further comments uh, related to the update uh, with the Operations Center, uh, but I do, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, put in a plug for our Health and Active Living Guide, if I could. Um, Good, sure, our, go ahead. Uh, our Health uh, and Active Living Guide has, uh, has now arrived. Uh, just a reminder that registration opens on Family Day, our Family Day event with our Health and Active Living Fair, which features our community groups and sports group partners, a three-on-three -three pond style hockey tournament, and the new roads uh, ice surface, a barbecue, and entertainment for all. Uh, we welcome all to join the event and uh, register early because programs, especially camps, fill early. Thank you. What, are they go, are they already out or are they gonna go and out? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the uh, guide is, uh, is on our website and it will be sent uh, with, uh, through the East Gwillimbury Express uh, uh, prior to the event. And then as well, we, for our, some of our newer homes that do not receive the Express, you can pick it up here. We require, the, you, can pick up a, you can pick up the guide at all our facilities. And as well, uh, we do provide a mail out, a, a postcard, which directs people to the website or our municipal facilities to, to pick up the guide since, as well. since we're live, I want to do a little promotion, so make sure they, they get the message. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, any other questions from members of the committees? None? We'll pass it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under corporate services with Councillor Morton in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we have uh, two items under corporate services today. The first one is uh, economic development branch presentation and economic development update. Mr. Valchich? Uh, Madam Chair, through you, uh, with your permission, uh, I'd have uh, Margot Bejan, our new uh, Manager of Economic Development, provide a, a brief update. Um, Margot started with us uh, in September and has already had uh, a big impact uh, in, with her presence here, bringing her experience, expertise, and credentials to bear in, in East Gwillimbury. And um, I certainly want to acknowledge that. And um, Margo is here today to uh, give you a little bit of a synopsis of what she's been doing in her, her first few months with us and some of her observations and thoughts. And you're going to be hearing more about this as we have upcoming uh, different sessions, workshops, and so on, where we'll be highlighting further discussions around 
economic development. So with your permission, I'll uh, turn it over to Margo. Margo, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you for this opportunity to address you, Madam Mayor, and, and members of council, um, colleagues, and members of the public. Um, as Mr. Val just said, my name is Margo Bajan. I'm the Manager of Economic Development. I'd like to introduce uh, one of the members of my team, Brittany Stevenson Byers, who is, uh, as Laura mentioned, one of the individuals that has been seconded to assist in economic development. Uh, we'd hope to have AJ Gove here as well, but unfortunately, he's a uh, man in the the ship uh, in customer service today and wasn't able to join us. But, um, you know, in terms of some of the work that they've been getting involved in, um, AJ is very closely involved in our broadband work that I'll touch on later in the presentation. Brittany's been very closely involved in um, updating our web presence and um, uh, wor working towards investment readiness. I will, there's a lot of material here, I will try to move through quickly in respect of your time. Um, that said, I don't want to rush, and please stop if you need me, if you need clarification or have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to address that. So in terms of how we got to uh, this presentation, when I first arrived, uh, one of the first things I did was sort of look at what we're, what we're currently doing, what's working well. Um, I sat down with um, each of you and members of senior staff to get a, get a sense of um, what the priorities are for economic development and for, uh, and for the community as a whole. And then um, added to that some additional research of, of best practices to, to sort of explore how we can how we can have an impact, how we can achieve some of these priorities. And that has resulted in uh, sort of a work plan outline that I've um, that I'm going to be addressing as part of this uh, presentation. So the, the, the key themes that have emerged through the discussion and through the work that um, preceded my arrival here are the enhancement of our business first or our, our concierge service, uh, business retention and expansion, revitalization of our downtowns, obviously enhanced broadband connectivity, community development, communication, and I say this in respect of uh, communication of our economic development aims and activities uh, specifically, and investment readiness and attraction. I just wanted to touch on briefly uh, that um, sometimes we think about economic development purely in the context of real estate development, and yet there are a whole host of other tools and areas that uh, practitioners get involved in to be able to advance those aims. And some of these uh, will factor into our work this year, and some of these will evolve over time as we refine our economic development strategy. So the first of the emerging themes is the enhancement of business first. And one of the first things that we looked at is that maybe business first isn't the right uh, way of addressing this because it's not about putting somebody before others. We have a responsibility to our residents, we have a responsibility to our heritage, to our environment. So it's really about what can we do to stand out and position East Willowbury as being um, business friendly and responsive. So I'm proposing that we look at leveraging our existing advantage, e.g. collateral, and start calling it business advantage, and that this be a place where um, business can see that they have advantages in working with us and investing here. And this, as part of the work that's going on in terms of our new logo, we'll start to um, embrace that, that work as we go forward. So the why of a business advantage is fairly straightforward. Um, you know, we, we don't currently have a competitive advantage in any particular sector yet, I'll say. I think we have lots of exciting opportunities. So in order to remain competitive and attractive to growth and investment, we need to be able to compete on our service delivery. Um, and I think that we know that our neighbors across North America and, and closer are all, all have some form of concierge service and, are, and many are taking some really significant dramatic action uh, to, uh, to tackle red tape reduction. So we know why we need to do this. The how is a little more complicated. These are some of the core um, essences, I think, of, of what we need to do when we're talking about business advantage and being able to um, be really responsive to growth, both um, growth within our community and growth that we attract from outside. And I think first and foremost, it's about a customer-centric corporate culture and a team approach that commits to over-delivering in, uh, in, in order to support the type of growth that we want to encourage. And we are regularly hearing um, from municipalities who are getting it right, uh, or from developers about municipalities who are getting it right. And those are the places where they're seeing advancements in internet um, service 
uh, investment. They're seeing businesses growing um, because developers are able to, or, or the municipalities are able to respond at the speed of business. And I think it's really important in the context of business advantage that um, we, we have to remember that we don't create jobs, businesses do. And if we want to achieve our job creation goals and build a sustainable and balanced economy, we need to be a place where people can do business efficiently, where they want to do business because they feel valued and because they're recognized, uh, because we recognize the risk that they take, the investment that they make, and their contribution um, as corporate citizens. When we talk about business retention and expansion, um, you know, we know that that's important because we're talking about growth and especially job growth. In any economy, 80% of job growth comes from existing businesses. So um, being able to support their growth and, re and be responsive is foundational to our, our goals around business advantage and our goals around uh, job creation. Um, we look at some of our significant employers, uh, you know, 40% of all of these, of all EG jobs are within uh, 10 or 10 or 11 employers. And I think that sort of helps us to prioritize who we need to be supporting in our business uh, visitation and efforts. Downtown revitalization and placemaking. First and foremost, uh, in this initial year, I think uh, there's an opportunity for me to work with uh, the folks that are um, undertaking the infrastructure upgrades and to be part of that conversation. And then we're also looking at um, some best practices where you can leverage or enhance uh, entrepreneurial ability to be able to uh, encourage businesses to, or to grow from concept to perhaps home-based business to having a, a storefront location and having a footprint that um, adds vibrancy and activity to our downtown core. So by supporting the capacity or building the capacity of our entrepreneurs, leveraging some of our regional partners who are able to do that, we can help to achieve some of our downtown revitalization aims. Broadband connectivity, um, there's a lot going on. Uh, we have a very active broadband subcommittee. And in fact, uh, things have changed since this uh, presentation was first drafted. We originally um, thought we were going to be going out and doing a gap analysis to our community. But because of some of the work that's been undertaken in terms of meeting with internet service providers, we've learned that um, Having enhanced connectivity is a lot closer than we thought. We've got some really interesting possibilities with a number of providers um, that as long as we can work with them and support them through their development uh, and be responsive, that I think we can, we can make some significant gains, gains within the next one to two years in terms of uh, connectivity for our citizens. Community development, I mean, economic development, of course, relates to the community development. Um, so we're talking about getting involved in uh, placemaking. Uh, I'm part of the conversations around wayfinding, all, because all of that speaks to the overall um, ability of, of business to thrive and of people to participate in the economy. Uh, certainly working towards enhancing our partnerships with the chamber and meeting regularly with the executive director, part of the arts council now, also taking on um, a bit of a role in terms of uh, guiding our corporate uh, climate adaptation and mitigation uh, plan. And as part of that, I'm working with the Joint Municipal Climate Change uh, Working Group to try to uh, assimilate some of their best practices and bring that back into uh, complementing the work that we do corporately with the work of the Environmental Advisory Committee. Community. Communication was also identified um, by yourselves as, a, as, a, as an important consideration, helping the community to understand and the business community to understand what our priorities are. And this is where I see uh, the Economic Development Advisory Committee playing a strong role. We recently underwent a strategic planning exercise with that committee. Uh, we validated the terms of reference and, um, in an effort to sort of refocus and re-energize. And, I'm happy to report that they've come away with uh, four, key, four key priorities in their work plan for this year, and communication is one of them. So some tactics that they're exploring are things like a, um, a business leader's breakfast or an symp economic symposium that they would do in collaboration with partners such as the chamber. Um, they want to be very actively involved in uh, crafting a new economic development strategy, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. They're also very interested in the um, economic development uh, dashboard that Laura referred to and in turn um, helping to shape uh, the development of that. 
And now we get to theme number seven, investment attraction. Uh, uh, I think a lot of the work that we need to do in the for this year is really focusing on enhancing our investment readiness. Uh, there was reference in our budget conversations to a development readiness project, and we're still sort of scoping out how we how we get there. But I think the objective in our work is uh, is something like the Ontario Certified Site Program, where um, you have shovel ready sites where the the zoning, uh, any barriers to development have all been dealt with. Um, and it's it's ready for development to come in and and build and and if you're part of that program and you also can leverage a whole lot of other uh, promotional opportunities as your your story is communicated globally. Um, I think the other the other areas that we're working on um, is ensuring that the quality of our information is there that we have the ability to respond and that we're able to have, respond with a level of service that moves from an initial inquiry to uh, to a development of a plan and to a completed project. Some of the other investment attraction tactics we're looking at, as I mentioned, Brittany's been very closely involved with um, updating the content of uh, the Advantage EG website, and that will all be um, connected in with the greater modernization uh, pro project. But And we've got opportunities to integrate GIS mapping features, and we know what uh, site selectors and investors are looking for, so we've got a very clear guideline in terms of where we need to go. Now it's just kind of putting the work in and making sure that we're, we're, we're doing it. Another project we've been scoping out is uh, understanding who's here in terms of the professionals and the skills that may not be captured through the employment survey that the region does. Um, and I have examples of best practices in other communities where by tapping into that, you can start having conversations about uh, perhaps relocating businesses here to East Gwillimbury or tapping into the expertise in a mentorship role. So it's really important to understand who's here and, and what their connections are. And finally, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're working to build an updated economic development strategy. As you may be aware, the last one was uh, created back in 2011, so it's time for a refresh. I'm very fortunate to have active involvement from the advisory committee on that. Uh, one volunteer in particular has really taken an active role as a consultant to be able to help us um, develop the strategy. I think we'll be able to do it with uh, minimal outside support, maybe perhaps some data research, but we hope to have um, a new strategy that outlines uh, what we have, what's going well, what we can build on, this, this, the target sectors that we feel are prime for investment, and um, be able to move forward with a new five-year strategy by the end of Q2. So looking ahead to Q2, um, I did in my an earlier iteration of this presentation, uh, the last few slides said uh, thank you and questions, and uh, our CAO pointed out this like, everybody does that, do something different. So I decided to talk about, okay, the next time you see me, or one of the next times, because I hope I'll be back to talk about lots of other exciting development projects. But what I am committing to you is that when I come back, I'm gonna be talking about new developments and the related job growth. Uh, how we're doing with some of the initiatives that I've just mentioned here, um, what, what our strategy, how the, the progress of our economic development strategy is going, uh, new partnerships and opportunities, and of course, Edmonton Oilers, Stanley Cup champions, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. Exactly. <laughs> I gotta stay true, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I get a motion to accept the presentation, please? Councillor Crone. Um, any questions uh, of <laughs> Margo? Councillor Whitey Clemente and then, Count and then Mayor Jackson. Uh, just to start off, uh, Councillor Foster, not everybody at the table is the worst. Just... Well, we outnumbered. You're, you're right. some, may, <laughs> I may be outnumbered, but I'm not a Leafs fan generally. Anyway. Oh. Um, <laughs> I don't follow right, hockey children. enough to really be one way or the other. But. Um, I, I just, I guess, at the beginning of our uh, of our meeting today, we were sort of patting ourselves on the back and talking about you know what happened in 2019 and what we did for the first year. Uh, forget that. Throw all that out. A hundred days, uh, and you've accomplished all this, and and really started to scope things into some uh, some measurable and uh, cohesive themes. And I think that uh, that speaks volumes. Uh, I wanted to ask briefly, I think you touched on it uh, at a very high level, that sort of target sector attraction, I think, is something that, you know, we've kicked around this table a few times to say, okay, what do we have and how do we build on that and how do we 
uh, how do we help those existing businesses add employees, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. that those existing, that growth happens with your, within your existing base? And how do we become, you know, one of those clusters where uh, we become a subject matter expert and that we have a, we have a, um, uh, I sort of think of it as a, a subject matter experts that are uh, a cluster of businesses that are complementary and, and, and we, be, we become seen as the place to go for Absolutely. something. I think that uh, if you could focus that a little bit more, I think that would be helpful so that we can also assist your efforts. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, through you, Madam Chair, that, the, that will be a core function of the economic development strategy. And in order to get there, there's the is SWOT analysis that we do internally with our existing, I mean, we have a pretty good idea of where our sector strengths are in terms of agriculture, agri-foods, manufacturing, construction, uh, healthcare, and then we have some other secondary areas of focus, uh, education uh, being one of them, tourism potentially, that we will explore. But it needs to be informed by business and understand you know, how they're growing and what, where they see the opportunities and then also data driven in terms of uh, where are the opportunities globally, what are the investment patterns that have happened uh, regionally and in Ontario and, and all of that kind of shows us where we have our, our strongest opportunities and that will be part of the strategy. Further questions? Mayor Haxon. Uh, just a comment, thank you so much. Um, Congratulations, 100 days, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. And I echo um, Councillor Roy D. Clemente's comments that um, let's see what next year in review looks like. I know that you're working on, <clears throat> excuse me, a number that um, are in, in the pot ready to go or starting in various stages. So uh, congratulations. I, I think the one thing that I hear from our community on a regular basis is where can I work in my town? And that's a little different than talking about home businesses. We know that they are wanting to stay for a variety of reasons, size and whatever, and hopefully we have some facilities that is rental office space that people can grow into. The other part of it is that we have people leaving town at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they're coming home at 7 o'clock at night. And so it's a matter of trying to take that skill sets that they have and the needs that we have and, and meshing them together. So. Not only are they not on the road, which is good environmentally, it's good for them uh, as a family, but they also become a part of our community. And unfortunately, uh, the longer they drive, the less they become a part. So I'm not, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but I'm watching for that one very carefully as Absolutely. well. We do have very, very skilled people in our municipality that travel out, out of uh, our community, and, and I can just see the opportunities of having them stay in. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just have to say to you, Madam Chair, um, that none of this was is possible without uh, my team, without the support of, of my boss, and without having fantastic folks in development services, because if we aren't working together, then none of this happens. So I'm really fortunate. Hearing no further questions, all in favor of that motion. Motion's carried. So our next item on uh, our agenda for corporate services communications branch memo communications tools update, Mr. Valtich. Uh, Madam Chair, through you, um, on a regular basis, um, our communication team, which is uh, consists of uh, Laura and Danielle, uh, they're a, a small team, but they um, they really uh, deliver an incredible amount of um, communications uh, to our public to try and make sure that. Uh, our public is well informed um, with accurate information, uh, relevant information on a timely basis. And from time to time, we reflect back on the number of different types of communication tools that we use, um, the information that we're um, circulating to make sure that it's um, continuing to be the most meaningful, relevant, and timely information uh, to our uh, various stakeholders, primarily our residents. And uh, more recently, we did uh, engage in a, a pilot exercise on a, a newsletter. Um, and so we, we referenced that in the memo. Uh, we also talk in the memo a little bit about um, some of the public events and, and some ideas that uh, we have, most notably uh, the um, public open house. And the fact that um, we've had a couple of very successful open houses and looking at um, ways that that program might uh, evolve even further 
where we might uh, start to have um, some of those uh, sessions in different parts of the community to uh, engage the community in a little uh, more uh, a direct way. So uh, this is uh, here just for your information. Uh, certainly uh, the director, I want to thank for uh, all of the work that not only went into this memo, but just when you can see the, the number of things that we do to try and make sure that we are uh, getting all the uh, important messages out to folks in a, in a timely and transparent fashion. And uh, either uh, Laura or myself are happy to answer any questions you might have in regards to the memo. Thank you. Can I get a motion to accept the uh, memorandum, Councillor Persicini. Any questions? Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to, uh, to staff, the, um, the memo uh, mentions uh, the uh, geofencing efforts to try and capture uh, those residents who aren't covered by the EG Express. And they're starting to become, I think, more numerous than those who actually do get the EG Express. I'm just wondering if we have any metrics as far as click-through rates and, and pick up from that, uh, whether that effort was worthwhile, and, and if, if so, great. If not, uh, what, are thing, what other things are we doing to try and reach uh, that, those demographic, that demographic for us? Because I know that the, kind of the, post, the, the, the postal routes are also difficult to reach, so we can't even just geofence that way. Mr. Veltage? Oh, okay. Sorry, Hannah. <laughs> Go ahead. That's all right. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, that's a great question. We are monitoring those metrics. So I did just touch base with the paper to review some of those for um, our geofencing advertisements that we've done to date. And based off of the advertisements and um, comparison baseline that they have for others, they're actually doing quite well. Some of the best ones that we've had would be things such as the Remembrance Day service. There's quite a through, few click throughs. Um, the numbers, I would say, they are lower through geofencing because it is somebody who's already gone to a website to find information that they're looking for and it needs to pull their attention away from there. So it is a good baseline for us and it's um, being conducted throughout the current budget. But in addition to that, you mentioned how else are we reaching them. So I think that our approach is to balance that with additional social media because we can target slightly through there as well and then through some of the road signs that we try to utilize as well. So we're trying to find a balanced approach. And then, for example, the guide that will be delivered in the next week to residents, those residents, as they're not receiving the paper, would get a postcard. So we try to supplement where we can through mailing as best we can to reach all of those. Uh, thank you. I, I would encourage staff to continue to explore other options rather than just uh, the York Region Media Group, but there are other ways to sponsor ads and, and take that budget and make it stretch a little further as far as uh, other geographic or, uh, or um, demographic ways of, uh, of digitally advertising to people rather than uh, just trying to get them to click on a secondary ad. So thank you. Um, further questions? Councillor Crone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, through you to uh, the staff. I uh, appreciate the report and uh, appreciate all your efforts too in, uh, in getting the uh, information out there. I don't think uh, we can ever do enough to communicate uh, out there, look at every medium possible. You know, as someone who spent part of his corporate life in marketing, it sometimes it's just trial and error. You know, you try something new, you know, uh, it may not work, but you know, failures are course correction for success. So we just have to keep, keep at it. But to thank you very much. I know we throw a lot at you and uh, I'm looking at you, Laura, because uh, I know you end, <laughs> ends up on your lap. So I appreciate uh, uh, you putting up with us. Uh, but yeah, yeah, this no matter how many times you communicate a message, it's never enough. And I, I think that's just something we all have to remember. But appreciate all the uh, the great work you're doing. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You had a question? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this report. It really pulls it all together for us. And I just wanted to thank you for all the work you've done with our advisory committees and our, our new community groups. So it's a, a lot of new stuff on your plate. And uh, they're really stepping up and they want to get that message out there. And you've been so willing to work with them. I just wanted to say on behalf of uh, the committees that I work with, thank you for all the work you've done with us. Thanks. No further questions. All in favor of the motion? And uh, just. Uh, 
from myself, Laura, uh, Mr. Valchuk said about the committee being small. They're small, but they're mighty. So uh, congratulations for all the work that you do. Um, are there any further questions for Mr. Valchuk? Okay, hearing none, I turn the chair back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under item L, administration with myself in the chair. We do have one uh, report regarding our holiday closing schedule. Could I have a mover, please? Councillor Persuccini, any comments, questions? I just have one. Uh, I think staff have been very creative to enable our staff to spend time with family over the holiday, and it, it's a moving target, uh, to, so to speak, with the the uh, significant faith days that that uh, move from day to day every year. And so I think uh, we have a, a good creative um, a working model here for this one. So thank you very much. Any other? Questions, comments? All in favor? And that's carried. Do we have any other business at this time? Seeing none, uh, could I have a motion to adjourn? Councillor Crothers, that will be at 12.05. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. <laughs>